Last time we were here visiting you, we didn't get an interview at the time, but you were doing a video called Cocapelli, and you were you had just come from uh, I think it's uh, down south in um, near Palm Springs uh, conference. Joshua Tree. Exactly, that you had given a speech about your findings about what's going on Actually, in a terms day, four day conference. Okay. Yes. With a but, lot of other researchers. Right. And um, I think maybe David Wilcock was there as David well. David was there. Sean David, David Morton was there. Sean David Morton was there. Um, one of my lunar researchers, Steve Troy, was there. Ken Johnson was there. Okay. And I really wanted to be there, but was, it, was not able to be there. But we were fascinated to find out that Richard Hoagland was now investigating what is happening to the planet as we enter what is this uncharted, you know, waters, in a sense, of the future going from now, 2008, we're right on the verge, to 2012 and beyond, and that we understood that you had some evidence that you were working on, and I think David Wilcock has ha actually helped you write, um, there's an article on your website called Interplanetary Day After Tomorrow mm -hmm. that begins to document the changes that are happening on other planets, not just our own Earth, um, in terms of the heating up of the planets and the changes. And what we want to talk to you about is, what did you find? The way I came to it, and what knits these two apparently disparate subjects together, what has NASA been doing all these years that it hasn't wanted us to tell us? And what is coming in 2012? Turns out to have a very critical, important connection. Remember, I started out looking at a set of Martian ruins. Even if NASA said they weren't ruins, they were just a trick of light and shadow. As part of that work, published in the Monuments of Mars and reiterated in great detail in Chapter 2 of Dark Mission, we tripped over this physics this physics that we are not supposed to know. I was told the other night by an Intel source on the phone, and this is an exact quote, it is so striking and so important that I get this right, because it exemplifies what's been going on behind the scenes for all these years in terms of them telling us the truth. I was told that they would rather give up a major American city, Perrin, to nuclear terrorism, then give up this physics. And the physics is the physics of anti-gravity, so-called free energy, even consciousness and life itself. It's all bound up with the fact that physics a hundred and some years ago when Maxwell was writing his equations and the modern foundations for electromagnetic theory were being laid in England, took a radical wrong turn. And in hindsight now, as I back and engineered this, and we talk about this in, in Chapter 2, it wasn't a wrong turn done by people who were misled, who were making mistakes, who just didn't know what they were doing. It was a conscious suborning of the truth. It was done by people manipulating science and scientists by controlling the journals, by creating the peer review process, by basically eliminating unwanted papers by attacking character assassination of scientists who were not following the straight and narrow, a conscious herding of the scientific community away from technologies and a fundamental understanding of physics that would liberate all humankind. In other words, control. Remember, I am back engineering this by looking at a set of ruins on another planet looking at some geometry and through exquisitely interesting steps that I won't bore you with now because they're in both books, realizing that we had laid out on the surface of another planet an entire physics, entire window to a whole new way of looking at the world, of looking at reality, of what really controls all the stuff up to and including our technology that we take so for granted and think works one way and in fact works on slightly and sometimes major different principles. So with that as backdrop, as I started looking at the ruins on Mars, and then I expanded my search to look at the ruins on the moon, 
and these little shards of glass and the confirmations that in fact it's all real. All this stuff that I've been saying all the years NASA's hiding, yeah, they have. Then the question if arose, if we're looking at ancient civilizations on these planets that are no longer there, what happened? I mean, if they have this almost magical godlike power, why aren't they still there? Why are we as their last surviving, you know, descendants in the model that they're us and we are them? Why are we in such an awful condition, fighting with each other over a few drops of oil, when the universe around us could provide limitless energy to build the staggering scale of stuff we find on right next door on the moon? Something must have happened. So that got me into thinking, okay, we know from terrestrial history that life does not go on that there in fact are bad things that happen. They happen to people, they happen to cities, they happen to nations, they happen to civilizations. Things have an ebb and flow. There's a, you know, Shakespeare, you know, the, the seven ages of man, beginning, the middle, and the end to, to, you know, collapse it. So, if this stuff, no matter how amazing the guys were that did this, if this could come to an end, and it looked like it came to in many cases, a catastrophic end. I mean, you look at the stuff on Mars, it's obvious that there was a huge planetary catastrophe that swept this away, that buried it under miles of muds and sediments, and it's been eroding, and we're seeing the traces of, of buildings peeking out from underneath. Even the Russians talk in some of their literature about buried cities under the sands of Mars in their mainstream scientific literature. So you look at all this, and I said to myself, okay, could this happen here again? Could everything we see around us, New York, skyscrapers, you know, the extraordinary technology that went into Apollo, all of the stuff we take for granted, that we're on this unending Victorian march into the future, could in fact it at some point come to an end? Could we currently go through some cataclysm like these guys obviously went through because they're no longer here. So that got me looking at things like ancient records. I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying, obviously. But it got me looking at ancient records. I mean, there's some amazing things in Egypt that I can show you. I actually have in this database that really prove that we are not the first. There was this eerie parallel between the face on Mars and the faces of the iconic pharaohs in Egypt, up to and including that headdress, which is called a menes, M-A-N-E-S. It had stripes. If you look at some of the early versions of the uh, Viking imagery of the face on Mars, it's got lateral stripes on both sides of the platform on which the face is lying. That told me that there was potentially an Egyptian connection. Then you fast forward the film and you get into people like Vladimir Avinsky, who was a Russian researcher, who completely separately in 1984 published in Soviet Life magazine um, a, a chronology of his investigation of Sidonia, and he wound up calling the face on Mars the Martian Sphinx. More fast forward to film. As part of my research, when Errol Torin came on board the, uh, the investigation, we realized one day that there was exquisite mathematical linkage between the physical placement of the ruins on Mars and the physical placement of the ruins in Egypt. In fact, the, if I remember this correctly now, the cosine of one was equivalent to the sine of the other. And the odds of that happening were like 7,000 to one. In other words, each special place with a sphinx and pyramids on two separate planets knew the other's location to within one part in 7,000. And that's just not in the cards. That's 